This is JadeCast, your gateway to traditional martial arts and Chinese culture. Brought to you by your host, Shuffle Jonathan Bluestein. Thank you for being with us today. My name is Jonathan Bluestein. I am a best-selling author and the head of Blue Jade Martial Arts International, as well as an amateur scholar of traditional Chinese medicine. And today I am proud to present my mentor, friend, and a person I very much cherish, Professor Stephen Jakovitz of Long Island, New York. So uh, Stephen, please introduce yourself to us. Well, thank you, Jonathan. I'm uh, Dr. Steve Jakowitz. I currently serve as the chair of the doctoral program in traditional Chinese medicine at the University of Bridgeport in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And although I am a New Long Island native, I make that commute to Connecticut regularly. I'm excited for us to talk about uh, traditional Chinese medicine and share some of our views and ideas out there. And uh, I've been lucky enough to been in be involved with East Asian medicine for, you know, the large part of my life, starting my study of it back uh, in the uh, early 1990s. All right. That's a long time. You've been practicing a long time. Well, you know, time flies and you never think it's that long till you look back on it. So that's always a measure and there's always more to look forward to. So hopefully uh, a little bit of practice of all those uh, Qigong exercises and such, I'll be able to be involved in this for a fair number of years more. We sure hope so. And prior to being an academic, you were also in private practice for many years, right? That's true. I actually, um, my undergraduate degree started me off in studying East Asian studies at uh, Harvard. And I wound up uh, going to South Korea and going to medical school there. And then eventually coming back, uh, doing more training in the U.S. at the New England School of Acupuncture for a while, where I taught subsequently, and then went on to get a PhD uh, studying the historical evolution of East Asian medicine, uh, and then wound up uh, teaching both history as well as uh, Asian medicine. Uh, and then eventually uh, I wound up uh, now pursuing a second PhD, uh, which is focused on a very uh, specific uh, approach and research to the Huang Di Neijing, the Yellow Emperor's classic of internal medicine, and looking at structural formats of how the text was created and how that can kind of help uh, understand it in a deeper way. So I've been doing this for a little while. I've been in private practice uh, back getting licensed back in the late 90s uh, and have worked in you know, a number of different schools and different supervisory roles as well as academic roles uh, and have published a fair number of uh, academic things on Chinese medicine. All right. That, that's, uh, that's quite a long list of things. Um, and today we are hoping to give some useful practical insight for TCM practitioners across the world and especially in North America. And let me start off by asking this. Um, you know, as we all know, East Asian medicine has been growing steadily more popular in the West over the past few decades. And um, nonetheless, we find that practitioners face certain challenges in their clinics which are not necessarily related to the medicine itself. Uh, could you kindly ex extrapolate on these things? Well, that's a great question. I think one of the things is that we are using the term East Asian medicine to be as inclusive as possible, but really using that to refer to the traditional medical system that uh, developed both in, in China, in Japan, in Korea, in Vietnam. There's there's variations in that. And so we're using the term East Asian medicine as uh, those, those methods and theories differ somewhat. When we see it transplanted to the West, uh, it's very interesting because we're taking something outside of the context in which it grew. We're taking something that then the pr practitioners who study in the West, many of them did not necessarily grow up using it and nor did the patients. And so there's a bit of a difference with the way people come to it in the West and a bit of a difference in how the field has formulated in regards also to Western medicine and where the two systems, the Western and the Eastern, really are a little bit different and have integrated to some extent, but not in the same way that you see in East Asia itself. 
And so there's often a challenge when the student goes and gets into practice, when they go into practice and they're coming into this, this world of private practice or even working in larger clinics and how they can move forward and develop a practice uh, in a world where it's kind of like an, a virgin territory, where it's still developing in the way it's viewed, in the way that the mainstream Western medical community views it, in our relationship to insurance, our relationship to billing, all of these things are still evolving during this time period. And so I remember when there wasn't really any insurance to bill, when it really wasn't that way, that people came in and said, oh, do you have coverage? That wasn't necessarily where we started out with, where everything was out of pocket. And when it was hard to find herb suppliers and when herbs were all the raw herbs and the granular formats and all the pill forms and weren't as available, right? So things have definitely changed. Even just the number of suppliers of needles and, and of, of cups and of all the different things that we use has changed. And even our clean needle technique manual and the way that we do things for our best practices has evolved over time. So it's an evolving part of the field. And so this has often led to challenges for the people who get out of school and how do they move forward? How do they build a practice and how do they reach out to the patient who can come in and can benefit from this? And that's really something that I've seen in the years I've been doing this and teaching people has been a real challenge because I see people who come out of school so talented in their ability to treat and then often floundering in their ability to make the transition to create a practice that supports them. And that's one of the things that maybe we could talk about today is that transition, how to get that practice to support them. Because practices, interestingly, aren't exactly businesses. So I think that's part of what perhaps, you know, can be the, the, the nexus of what we discussed today. All right. And there was a story you told me before we started the recording about a student of yours that I think could exemplify this quite well. Certainly. So I, over the years, I've worked with a lot of students, worked with, worked with students as they've gotten into practice. So one of the things that one of the students had, had uh, contacted me this number of years ago and had gotten out of school and was, in, was going through what we call boom bust. Boom, all of a sudden people come in and it seems like it's busy and it's a groundswell and it's going, going, going. And then bust, the numbers fall off. And all of a sudden it seems like everybody deserted the practice. And, and, and he was really confused. And he's like, I don't get it. I'm, I'm, I'm working as hard as I can. I'm trying to keep their, their interest at heart. What's going wrong? So we talked about this, we looked at it. And one of the big things is that the question of not treatment, the question of treatment plan, the question of how do you string together the treatments into a larger plan? How do you communicate that plan to the people? How do you get them to understand that this works over time? So with the student in question, we had to look and say, well, what were you doing? How are you talking to them on their intakes? How are you talking to them on the day, first day they come in? How are you explaining to them that this is progress over time? And progress over time requires you to keep going. Are you making the analogy to them that this is like, like going to the gym where exercise pays off over time? That this is like physical therapy that pays off over time? And are you setting benchmarks when you're going to reevaluate. So for the student in question who was doing a lot of musculoskeletal work, right, to say with the people, all right, we've got to quantify some of the measures, measure what's going on, give a number, use a goniometer, which measures the angle of a joint, to say, what range of motion do you have? How much can we see that change? Measuring that over time, but also sticking to a plan saying, all right, we're going to work 10 times, then reevaluate and do a little reevaluation. And in the reevaluation, letting the patient review with you the things that they came in with, saying, wait a minute, your range of motion was here. Your, your number of hours you slept were like this. You rated your sleep quality this way, right? Showing them all the things that have changed so that the patient can realize the change, incremental. The patient can agree, say, wait a minute, this did work. These 10 sessions taught me or brought me somewhere. And therefore, they can choose to come and say, oh, wait a minute, I want to do 10 more. I want to work on that plan again because it's incremental change. And that really changed my students, you know, his practice because it was saying, okay, you need to not only on the first day, discuss this plan, schedule the plan, put the person on the schedule, 10 weeks, same time if they can, but 10 weeks out if it's a 10 week plan. 
right? Schedule them and schedule the reevaluation. Actually reevaluate on the day of reevaluation. Actually keep them so you know where they're going. Just like I had said to him, if you're driving from New York to Cincinnati, there's checkpoints on the road to make sure you're going the right way, that you know where you're going and you're not making a wrong turn. Because if you make a wrong turn, you wind up somewhere else. And that's the same thing that you have in treatment, working in that sequential format. And that's one of the things that oftentimes the, we kind of fall a little short on in the West. And I think we fall short on that for a couple of reasons. Right? One of the reasons is that the patients don't realize what this medicine is like. They don't realize that it works in that format. And so that's something we need to help the patients understand. We need to get them in that mindset. Other thing is that oftentimes in student clinics, student clinics are great, but student clinics are a little artificial. They work on a semester base. Maybe the patient says, oh, I'm coming every day for the semester. The intern doesn't really feel the same relationship to the patient as they do when the patient's helping to pay their rent. When, when really the person coming forward, there's a financial component that you want the patient to come. You certainly want them to get better. It's medicine, but you also can't keep your doors open if you don't have a patient volume. Mm -hmm. So the relationship is different when you go into private practice. It changes things a little bit. And when you're in a student clinic, you're kind of stuck a lot of times on, well, this person's going to come on the Monday shift at two o'clock. Maybe they should come twice a week. Maybe they should come once every two weeks. Maybe they should come three times a week. Different concerns require different timing, but you can't always pull that off in the student clinic. You really are kind of conjoined into the structure of the student clinic. And the intern certainly got, have to, has to learn from the supervisor. The supervisor has a certain point of view and a lot of experience, and, and that's wonderful, and you'll learn a lot from those supervisors. But at the same time, maybe the supervisor is putting this patient into a certain you know, level of understanding or a certain bracket that the intern doesn't have yet. If the intern's not up to understanding what goes on, or the intern would have approached it on a more basic level, which maybe would have worked, but it would have taken more time. So a lot of times you work with the supervisor and you say, okay, that's the captain. I'm going to follow the captain. I'm the player. And that's fine. Once you're in private practice, you go into the room with the patient and close the door. Well, I guess you're the captain and you got to be the playmaker on the field trying to figure out what to do. So that part is often a, a challenge in transition. All right. So I think if we segment everything you said into uh, three main issues, so I'm starting from the end. Uh, first being a type of relationship that one needs to learn to develop with patients in private practice, which is different to the type of relationships that he or she had when they were in the student clinic. So that's one important thing. Um, another thing is numbers, scales, and benchmarks, which we may have for ourselves, but not they're not necessarily shown to the patients. So it's fine and dandy that someone has this in their papers, on their computer, in their mind, but unless the patient sees those numbers, scales, and benchmarks, as they affected him or her, then it's not as effective because they have to, to understand it on the same uh, physical level, not the theoretical, technical level, but the same physical level that the practitioner does to see the, that progress. And thirdly, I'd like to uh, quote Will Durant here, Will Durant, the author of um, The Story of Civilization, um, uh, an 11 book volume collection on the uh, entire history of mankind from prehistoric times to Napoleon. And he was um, summarizing some of Aristotle's teachings uh, by writing thus, that we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. I shall repeat that. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. And I think this relates to the first thing you were saying, that the patients come in, and they believe that the uh, medical procedure with accordance to TCM principles is going to be something akin to a surgery. You come in once or twice, you get something moved or removed somehow, and then it gets fixed. It's like fixing a car. Uh, but rather, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence is not an act, but a habit. It has to be continuous. And this sort of mindset has to be ingrained into the patient, right? Right. Yeah, I do agree. I agree. I think I think one of the biggest challenges that you see 
in the West is that Westerners, our culture in the modern day has become one of instant gratification. And so we really are focused on have it now, buy now, pay later. That's a real common rubric that goes on in society. And so what happens is when patients come in, they don't always understand or they're not necessarily you know, made aware right away that this is a process. So it's a process. And, and East Asian medicine is natural, it's a natural medicine. Pharmaceuticals are rarefied, they're reductionist medicine, um, but East Asian medicines are natural. Natural medicines work more slowly. They hopefully have fewer side effects if used correctly, but they move more slowly. And so you need change over time. And the person has to understand that, that it's an incremental change. And the patient has a hard time, many of them, certainly not all of them, but many of them have a hard time recognizing incremental change. Even if we use number scales, if we use number scales such as, oh, my pain's nine out of 10, my pain's eight out of 10. Well, if it goes from eight or nine out of 10 to five or six out of 10, that's a lot better. But that's sometimes hard because it didn't just stop. And the movement coming down, which may take weeks, is challenging many times for the Western patient, as opposed to an opioid. You take an opioid and the pain's gone. It comes back when you stop it, but it's gone. So that's a big challenge to say, wait a minute, you've got you've to get them to understand how incremental change occurs. So that's one big thing right there. I'd also say that it's based on the principles that the practitioners utilize and are clear because if we want to go back to the Huang Di Neijing, right, the section 54, chapter 54, which is the, the exposition on needles, it says clearly in there, your success or failure, the difficulty comes through your principles. It's right there in that chapter saying if your principles are strong and you're, you understand it clearly, that's how you define that. So the practitioner and patient need to be very clear on that. Sun Sun Miao in the Chen Jin Yao Fang, the collection of a thousand with a thousand gold pieces, it's 625. So the first step in treatment is control of the patient's mind, meaning meeting their expectations, making them understand, making them understand how that this is a process. And traditionally we say for every year you've had the problem, it's a month of treatment. So a five-year problem is five months to see it get to a level where it can hold steady in the remediation. That type of communication is so necessary to take the patient and understand that, especially the Western patient who did not grow up with this, who did not have this going on all the time. So that's really an important part of building a practice and building things so that you can maintain that and have the practice be the platform for good work. Because as we said before, practices aren't exactly businesses. They're a little different. So this is seriously fascinating stuff. Uh, let me ask you, in your opinion and experience, how can a former student and current practitioner bridge the gap between the formal schooling and the requirements of private practice? According to the examples you just gave now, perhaps uh, some of that bridging the gap could be found in the classics, actually? Well, that's a challenging question because the thing is the classics is a very amorphous term. Right? We're talking about East Asian medicine. We're talking about a medical system that spans thousands of years. We're talking about books, many, 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 many books. And less than 5% of all the classical literature that exists has been translated from classical Chinese to modern Chinese. And of that has been translated to modern Chinese. And an even smaller percentage has been translated into Western languages. The majority of things that exist have not been translated. So there's no way anyone can be familiar with all of the classical literature. It's just impossible. Also, what we really need to work with many times is standardized modern approaches. That's why the, the foundation of modern TCM, starting in 1953 with the actions of the Communist Party to standardize it and professionalize it, has really brought a high standard to what's done. And the standardized textbooks and the standardized materia medicas, the standardized approaches are really helpful, especially because they are integrated in some, some sense with Western medical ideas. Western medical categorizations are addressed in that format. And so certain things like, like high blood pressure. High blood pressure was not addressed historically, classically. It's a, a modern understanding with the ability to measure high blood pressure. There are patterns historically that existed that we've been able to summate and say, oh, those were, were blood pressure unchecked. Right, but, but even like that or hepatitis, hepatitis, viral hepatitis was not understood because they didn't, weren't able to check for the virus. 
but rather right, they, we've been able to understand certain patterns that showed up separately that were caused by viral hepatitis. So the modern standardization has really allowed us to, to operate in a modern clinical setting. And that's really where people need to start. That's really a good place to start before one makes a, a foray into the classical world. Most importantly is, I think, for the transition into private practice and the, and the effectiveness of private practice is understanding metrics of success and metrics of failure. That when you go in with the first day with the patient, you have to be able to predict what will be a sign that I'm going in the right direction? What would be a sign I'm going in the wrong direction? And you can have a, lot, a large range of how you do that. You can follow something like the Kazato method of the Japanese, which focuses very much on pulse and say, oh, certain positive pulse changes could mean I'm going in the right direction. How do I chart those and go forward, right? Or you could you know, work with certain constitutional ideas like you see in the Korean medicine, where you're like, okay, this constitution has this tendency. How do I predict the tendency of whether it's healing or whether it's degrading? If you look at the modern TCM ideas where we use a lot of numerical quantified measures, where you might use a goniometer to range, check the range of motion, where you might use pain scales, where you might use standardized, standardized uh, approaches to, to create a quantified metric and say, this is the metric of me moving forward. This is the metric of me moving backwards and then be, be able to pilot that forward. And as you mentioned earlier, Jonathan, communication with the patient, where it, you might have that in your notes, but the patient doesn't understand, this is where we're going. And this is why I need you, patient Mr. Johnson. This is why I need you to do these exercises. This is why I need you to do this and change your diet this way, or to take these herbs on this schedule. I always tell the students, I go, herbs are the greatest medicine that don't work when you don't take them. And if you don't swallow them, you don't follow the, the plan, they don't work, right? And so that's the thing. You need to acculturate the patient. Give them this cultural foundation of understanding a natural medical system because our Western world is very divorced from nature. And how do we use natural uh, abilities? I mean, we can tout the abilities of the body to heal itself. Sure, but at the same time, your body can't heal itself unless you're engaged in it because you are the emperor or empress of your body. So say the classic, right? So you have the control to close the borders, right? And not take in the medicine that can help you or open the borders and engage with the doctor in the world. So it's part yeah. of that planning that really helps make the person survive in practice. And that's why you need to help the patient understand. We can call it control the patient. And then maybe people go, oh, control, they don't like that word. All right, well, the Chinese word, zhi, for control or govern or treat. All that, if you look at the character itself, it has the water radical, it has the dam radical and the mouth radical. And it is the word to govern like govern a country, for it means damn the water to feed the people. And so that is the word used to treat someone, which is to control the waterways or the fluids in their body and nourish them. And therefore control is not a bad thing. But if you don't control the patient enough, to understand how to move forward, then they are always caught in their pathology. And as one of my teachers said to me, he said, he said, if you could cure cancer and you don't tell anybody and you don't guide them to the 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 treatments that they need, then you're going to hell. He said, the clearest <laughs> way to hell is having the ability to help them and not setting up the platform to do it. And that's why I said before, practices aren't businesses because a business is just based on money. But a practice is a platform, a platform for the good work that you're going to do. You got to pay the rent, you got to pay the electricity, you got to buy the supplies, you got to get the cleaning supplies and do all the good things that you do. But you have to understand that the practice is supported by those financial dynamics, not driven by them. And that's very important. And if the plan is there and the person will come in, they'll get success. The practitioner will be able to have the finances come in to support it. They'll be able to have enough finances to support them. So when the hard luck case comes in, they can give the person a discount where they can help the person out who can't afford it. That can't happen if you're starving. So that's why it's important to get those things going and help the patients understand and be acculturated to that model so they know what to expect and know how it works and then they can get the most out of it. All right. So you said something very interesting that I would like to ask you about, uh, about the practice not being a business. But first of all, before we get to that, I would like to quote the famous uh, Chinese medicine sage, Tony Robbins. <laughs> well, not really, but he's a controversial figure, but he's, uh, you could definitely not say that he's not a smart guy. He is. And um, 
like him or not, sometimes he has sagely advice. And one of the important things that I learned from this man was that he said, when you would like to motivate people to do something, goals are good, but they are not superior. Because if you set goals for yourself or people set goals for themselves or you help them set goals, that's little increments that they could follow. But what really defines what a person is going to do in the long term is how they view themselves, their self-image. So if a person decides, just for instance, that they're going to be sick forever and they have this image in their minds, it doesn't matter how many goals you set for them. So in discussing this very important topic of how to control the patient, it's one thing to tell them, take your meds on time, but there are underlying currents of how they view themselves and their condition and whether they can even get out of their condition because maybe they've been told by 20 practitioners prior or maybe they've even just been told by someone in kindergarten that they'll always have this, they'll always be that type of person. And that's their self-image. And that self-image casts a very big shadow over everything the practitioner does. So if you could just, before we get to uh, how come the, the practice is not exactly a business? Prior to that, could you talk a little bit about controlling the patient in the sense of helping them change their self-image? I think that's a, that's a great question. It's a great observation. I think this is really interesting, right? Because in Chinese, there's multiple terms, especially in classical Chinese. In classical Chinese is what the classics are written. In. And the classics are very, you know, they, they capture the imagination of the Western student. Classical Chinese is a dead language. It's a language like Latin. Right? Latin is the, is the ancient form of Italian. And a modern Italian speaker doesn't intrinsically speak Latin. They might have a leg up on learning it, but it's a little different. Classical Chinese is different than modern Chinese. It's the old form. And those words changed over time. And so we're talking about thousands of years. And also that, that was the way that things were written in those other countries, in China, Japan, Korea, Vietnam they also used classical Chinese to write things down, much like Latin was used throughout Europe. And I mention that simply because when we're talking about these old books, you know, we, we, we have a lot of terminology and, and the words are very specifically defined. But in Chinese, we have the word bing, bing for disease. And bing disease is a core idea that you can have a disease and a disease has certain patterns and certain things that link together in it. Okay. So the, the disease itself may have sub patterns, the zone, the patterns that are there. But there's also the word G, which is the word suffering. And this is why I bring this up, is because you may have a disease, but your experience of the suffering of the disease is, can be very different from another person with the same disease. So two people who both have what we call B syndrome, which is most times a type of arthritis, right? They have arthritic degradations, they may have the same range of motion, they may have the same presentation of this, but their suffering may be very different. And that's the mind. That's the mind. The mind, how does it view things? How does it look at things? And I'm reminded of a story from Zhuangzi, right, the great Taoist sage Zhuangzi, who writes a story within the Zhuangzi, he write, writes a story about a man whose body is being deformed and changed, who has some sort of terrible deformative condition where he's hunched over and his head is, his neck is crooked and he's, he's, he's looking up, he can bear, he's, he's turning, one eye sees the sky, one eye sees down, his, his body's horribly misshapen from this degeneration. And his friend visits him and says, oh my God, it's getting worse, it's so bad, it's so bad. And he says, no, he goes, look at how the Tao is changing me. He goes, before I could not see heaven at all times, but now I can see heaven above. He says that every time I change and every day I get up to say, I'm in a different world, but my body has changed my position in the world. And that story is really a story about suffering, a story about mind. It's a story about how your perspective changes your potential. That potential and perspective are really the issues in mind. So as you said, if you are convinced that you're sick forever, if you're convinced that you're not able to heal to the way, the way you want to, then that's true. It's the way it is. And it has nothing to do with the power of belief in Chinese medicine or belief in East Asian medicine or belief in Western medicine because medicine doesn't work on belief. Medicine works on certain physical dynamics, calling even qi a physical dynamic. But rather, if you always believe that it's the end of the world, then I guess it is the end of the world, right? That it's a terrible thing. 
right? Because you might be, it's a sunny day. You're like, oh, damn, it's so hot. You're like, it's a rainy day. You're like, I guess I can't go outside. No matter what, you can, you know, you can, William Blake said, man, can make a heaven of hell or a hell out of heaven, right? That ultimately, you have that ability. And that needs to control the mind. To control the mind and let the person have the confidence to say that the treatment plan can take you somewhere. It's medicine. It's not magic. It does not work 100% of the time. And ultimately, life is a limited quantity. No one gets out of life alive. So ultimately, it comes to an end. And the doctor bears witness to that. And the doctor sees that. And the question is, the patient who comes in, how can they change to be in a different state? How can you have a transformation on their zhuang tai, the structure of their qi, and thereby change that so that their jing, their essential core of being a human, can move through the qi, the metabolism of being alive, to elevate to shen, the spirit of being aware and conscious. That's the medicine. That's the sanba. That's the three. That's the three treasures. The treasures that we talk about in Chinese medicine all the time. And that's the flowering of spirit that we're after. And that's how, if, if people have read Lonnie Jarrett's book, Nourishing Destiny, he's very famous in the TCM world for writing a book about what's the purpose of medicine. But the purpose of, of medicine is the nourishing of who you could be. And who you could be is not metered by the mud and the minerals that make up your flesh. It's the, that is the encasement of your spirit. And so how do we work on that? That wax is a little bit philosophical, right, in some sense. But at the same time, that's what we mean by control the mind. We don't mean control the mind is manipulate them and get the extra money out of them. No, 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 not that at all. But rather control the mind to say, we're going that way. Guide them. The very character Tao that everyone's so fascinated with, the, the Tao. The word Tao is made up of the Chinese character for the back of your head and the road. And the Tao is the guy, the Taoist. The Tao is the symbol of the person going down the road that you get to follow. And then he'll take you somewhere. You'll get something out of that practice. That's where the doctor can engage Ida, the Tao of medicine, to guide you to a better place. And that's what we mean by control. So it's very important because if they don't know that, they don't know that 10 steps, 20 steps, 100 steps takes them somewhere else. They go, why am I taking steps? Right? Each step may be a little uncomfortable till it gets you where you want to go. Okay, I so- think it- Sorry. Um, I think it was Su Samyao who had written back in the day that when one treats a patient, they must shut the doors and windows and come close to them and share intimately with them and talk about their own personal journey or personal issues that is using modern Western language in order that they would feel comfortable so that both the doctor doesn't feel embarrassed to ask and that the patient doesn't feel embarrassed to tell. And so you can reach that original self-image, again, in our modern terms, and really touch on that point and help the patient shift their perspective, right? Yeah, I think, I think we have to watch a little bit because in the modern day, we do keep a professional barrier, professional distance from the people. Mm. So we can't necessarily do that the same way. It's a little different world than it was then. You know, we operate a little differently as opposed to being a village doctor. I'm not really the village doctor, right? So, but, but yes, the question of how do you gain their confidence? How do you be someone who's not putting on uh, just a social face? How do you imbue into them your earnestness and the, you know, the, the, the true sense that you're in the trenches going to fight for them, that you're going to help them move forward. I think that's really what that drives at. And being able to then say, okay, where are we going? I mean, I've treated a fair number of people at, you know, end of life care and, you know, them trying to, to come to grips with the fact that, okay, we've got a limited amount of time. You know, where do we go to? How do we make the most of it? So that when the story ends and the house lights, you know, come up and you've got to exit the stage, how do you say, yeah, I didn't have unfinished business that the story came to, to where it was. Because that's the ultimate kind of, that's the ultimate thing the doctor bears witness to. The doctor has to bear witness to life, to illness and to death, right? Those are the same things that ultimately age, right? Illness and death is what drove Sakamuni to go seek enlightenment and become the Buddha. 
right? That's what the doctor sees play out on her or his treatment table all the time, you know? And so how do we work with that, right? And now we have to be technical. We're technicians, we're doctors. We measure weight of different herbal ingredients. We retain needles for certain periods of time. We do certain number of stimulations to them. We work a muscle, like sometimes we work on a range of motion. We are technicians. We work very technically. We need to have technical measures of understanding so we can see if we're working correctly. At the same time, we need to safeguard compassion and safeguard the qualitative aspect of humanity while we do this. So we have to balance those two out. And I believe that the students who come through school are very good in the, at the humane part. They're very good at the part where they're so kind in their hearts that they can't sleep at night worried about their patient. But sometimes they have a hard time on the quantitative measure because you asked before about why I said a practice is not a business. Because mm -hmm. a business only works or only aims to make a level of profit. That's not a bad thing. But if you go to the camera shop and you buy cameras, the more cameras they sell, the happier they are. So they sold a lot of cameras, hopefully good cameras, but they sold cameras. And they sold them. And every camera, if they sell 100 cameras or 1,000 cameras, hopefully, as long as they're made well, takes pictures just as, as well as the other camera. That's not true for a, for a doctor. That's not true in your practice. There's a limit to the number of people you can see each week with whom you can concentrate, of how you can focus. You cross that limit, and the quality of your subsequent treatments goes down. You're not as sharp. You're not as accurate. You're no longer seeing the person. You're seeing the person who you saw last week. You're not seeing them in the here and the now, you're seeing them in the then before. And so you're treating them not on what, how they present today to work with and say, wait a minute, I gotta work, I can't work it too hard. You're just going by rote. And so now you lose the ability to be engaged with them and you lose the chi. For chi ultimately is the vibrant connection in the moment. So you lose that. And as you lose that, then all of a sudden, you, you start to fall down. You don't get the result. You don't follow on with them. You don't place that herb order as quickly as you need to. You don't do those things because you cross the limit because you are a limited expression of the medicine, the medicine working through a person. And we talked about the classics before and I said people need to work on this modern standards in many ways. Sure, because we realize that the classical tradition all the way back to the time of the mythical yellow emperor, all the way to now, all the way up through the great scholar Chinbo Wei in the Republican period, and all the way now to the scholar, to whoever's here now, and to the teachers who teach those students. All of that only exists for one reason. So those people and all that they've taught over thousands of years somehow informs the practitioner who's in the room with that patient in that moment, in that clinical event, to bring together what they can to help that person. And that's, that's the summation of the tradition in the individual. And you need to stay fresh on that. That's why that's not a business. It's a platform, platform to do the good work, platform to help the person. And if you understand that, then you say, huh. And one central piece of advice as people are in practice or going into practice, they need to sit down and figure out what in their hearts is the sincere aspect of the manifestation of this grand tradition in their office. So I always tell the students, my students when they graduate, I say, take a blank piece of paper. Forget everything anyone ever told you and write down on that piece of paper how you would like to be treated. What would it be like if you walked into a clinic? What's the perfect clinic like? Does it smell like moxa? Does it not? Does it have a beautiful decor? Does it look like a medical office? What is it like? Right? Write that down. Write down how long is the treatment? What it would be like? What type of needle stimulation? What type of cups? What type of, what would it be like? Write down it exactly that you would say, that's how I'd like to be treated. That's what I'd like someone to provide to me. And then take that and structure your practice that way. Because that's what's in your heart. Don't listen to all the people who will tell you, you know, you got to do facelifts. You know, you got to do lots of musculoskeletal. You, know, you got to do a lot of, a lot of herbs. You got to do a lot of diet. You got to, oh, don't listen to that. Why? Because you don't got to. Ultimately, you don't got to. What you got to do is you got to find what's in your heart. And then you'll be sincere. And if you're sincere and you push hard, and you work hard and you set up a plan to carry the people forward in the way that you see the medicine working, then they'll always take you as being earnest and honest and a person who they want to be associated with. The moment you're, you're trying to run somebody else's version of a practice, you're nothing more than a salesman. 
And nothing wrong with salesmen. Don't take it that way. But in that sense, you're no longer a doctor. You're just trying to sell. You're, you're, you're a purveyor of needles. As my teacher in Korea used to say, he goes, are you just a needle seller? Or are you actually someone who's trying to help someone? So I think that kind of pulls that together, that idea of why a practice isn't exactly a business. This is fascinating. And it's uh, in a way a bit similar to things I've written about in my book, The Martial Arts Teacher, in consideration of the traditional Chinese martial arts school as being something that's not exactly a business like a store or a gym that provides a membership service. It's far beyond that because it's a community. For some people, it's even almost a family. And it has a lot of tradition in it and a lot of social values that come alongside one's wish to make a decent living, to put food on the table. It's not necessarily contradictory, but there are other aspects and elements who, which come into play. Um, I would like to ask you, as someone who has studied East Asian medicine, both in China and Korea for many years, how would you say that patient base differs between those who come to get treated in Asia as compared with the people practitioners encounter in North America in their clinics? That's a great, that's a great question. And it's a, it's a question with many layers to it. Try to keep it, try to keep it under control a little bit. But generally speaking, in Asia, since the people grow up around the medicine, they're very familiar with it. And they have a very clear expectation that they got to go regularly. They've got to participate and do what the doctor tells them. And they also understand that it's medicine. And like all medicines, medicines work on percentage. Medicine doesn't work all the time. Medicine ideally works as well as it can, but if, if, if you went to the Western medical doctor and he gave you a pill and that pill didn't work, you wouldn't discount all of Western medicine as being nothing but claptrap. You'd be like, well, that one didn't work. Doc, I'm back, I need another pill. You'd be back to him. Well, that's what the Asian patients are like. They're like, you know, I don't know, that, 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 technique you did on my shoulder didn't help too much. Let's do a different one. Okay. Yeah, there's something that we see quite a bit with uh, traditional Chinese medicine and East Asian medicine, generally speaking. And it's quite unfortunate that someone would come to get treated for the first time. They come to one or two, maybe three treatments. It's not as successful as they had hoped, or perhaps they were unlucky and they encountered the charlatan, which can also happen. And then they go about for the next 20 or 30 years telling everyone that East Asian medicine is quackery and it doesn't work because of their one bitter experience. And it's akin to, you know, go into the gym, you lift weights for one month, didn't work out as much. So uh, going to the gym must not be a good way to build muscle. Exactly. Exactly. And that's the thing. People discount it. And, and it's unfortunate. It's very unfortunate because that person may have been able to get a good benefit if they had followed a plan, right? So if they had been able to follow the plan. So that's one big difference. Another difference is that the Asian patient comes in and says, yeah, my shoulder hurts. You go, where? They go all over here on this area and they show it to you and they go, yeah, it hurts when I do this. And then you go through the, the, the list of other things like how do you sleep and how do this? And they, they'll tell you and they're like, all right. And then you get to work on the shoulder. Many times, not always, many times the Western patient will come in with an amorphous undefined state of malaise where they're like i don't feel quite right i don't know what's wrong i don't know i don't i don't know I don't. and they come in in a way that they don't have a set defined thing that they're coming for because they feel disaffected they feel off now sometimes we can help that i'm not saying we can't but i'm saying that's a much harder thing to treat so if you're treating something that is more of a mood disorder, even a low-grade disaffectation, where the person is saying, you know, I just don't feel right. Well, in Western medicine, they're like, oh, they scratch their heads also, send them to psychotherapy, maybe give them some chemicals, but they're like, oh, this is going to be a hard one. Here we go. The, generally speaking, the patients in Asia who come in are very expectant that acupuncture could help in the musculoskeletal realm. That the, uh, that the herbs and the acupuncture together could help with their fundamental metabolic processes, can help with diabetes, can help with, can help with uh, you know, um, um, allergies, with asthma, with, with different types of digestive disorders and such like that. And they also, they're, they're kind of expecting to say, yeah, mental illness may be hard to treat. 
and and even just mood disorder, which is not necessarily so clearly a heavy mental illness, but they're like, ah, oh, that's a little hard to treat. And they kind of come up with that expectation. So I think that what happens is in the West is we're faced with patients who don't know where to go and they come to us last. So they come to us with what we call tertiary care. Primary care, there was first doctor, secondary care was a specialist and then tertiary care, they roll in and they go like, I'm gonna try something different. Now you gotta realize East Asian medicine, traditional Chinese medicine is the oldest continuously practiced form of primary care medicine in the world. It's primary care traditionally, right? It's, it's based on the guy fell out of the tree and got hurt, right? Because he was trying to climb up and, you know, you know, get something or whatnot, or he's in the field and he got hurt and, and we could fix it right away. Or the person, you know, had some really bad diarrhea, really bad digestive things, and they came to the doctor right away. We are traditionally primary care. So you're taking a primary care system and employing it as tertiary care for very complex things and maybe things that are too far for what we can do. I've had patients, unfortunately, people contact me, they have four stage terminal cancer, what can we do? And we'll try, but really at that stage, oftentimes we're palliating so they don't feel as bad while they pass, right? First stage, maybe something else can be done, right? So the thing is, it's also that understanding of when to go. I had people come in, they go, I've had back pain for 18 years and three surgeries. And they go, what, what, what can you do with me? I go, I could have done a lot more 17, 17 and a half years ago when you first hurt your back. So what I kind of did, I'm driving at in that is to say, the Asian patient understands when to come, that maybe this is a earlier intervention. The, the only other thing with, with this is that the Western patient, not all, but the Western patient often is looking for some solace. They're looking to be heard. And this is a critique that many people have of Western medicine, where the Western medical doctor, due to financial demands and due to demands of how practice is structured and such, doesn't have much time to talk to you. The Western medical doctor comes in, quickly checks things and has to go out, and he has to see six, sometimes 10 people per hour. And people come in and they're looking for someone to help them unravel the story of what went on and how did they get there. And they come in and that's often a challenge to the people doing East Asian medicine in that the patient starts to control the clinical encounter and tells the story or says, I look this up and I want cupping when maybe that's not indicated. Or I want gua sha, maybe it's not indicated. I want you to do bloodletting. Maybe it's not indicated. The patient comes in looking for some to tell a very extended story and be given some credence for it. And at the same time, sometimes wanting to direct what goes on and that doesn't always get them the resolution they need. So it's often hard for us, the East Asian medical practitioners, to navigate that and navigate how to get the person onto a plan that actually could help them. Often a challenge. And whether the person has a weakness, a deficiency, but they want to see themselves as strong, or they have an excess that's blocked and they want something that tonifies or makes them stronger. Right? These are things we have to navigate. And this is part of that thing we talked of controlling the mind, but we also have to make sure that the patient does not control the clinical encounter. Otherwise, the, the person's pathology sometimes runs the show. And then how can they get better when the pathologized body is trying to elect what it feels it needs, as opposed to what the practitioner can understand they that's one of the challenges of being in practice and developing that skill and developing that ability to set the plan and stay on the plan. Because as you know, Jonathan, sometimes practitioners will jump from their diagnosis week to week, treatment to treatment, and never make any headway. I can tell one small story relevant to this. That I had a patient, right, a gentleman with, who was um, paranoid schizophrenic. And so paranoid schizophrenia, he, he was typified as what's called Dien syndrome, Dien syndrome, which has multiple formats, but, but it's, it always includes phlegm misting the mind as a pattern okay, within that. And so he was very nice. He was taking some Western medicines, but he had problems. And he would present a little differently over the seasons we saw him, over the time we saw him. And his pulse would vary. Sometimes it'd be more slippery, sometimes more soggy, sometimes more soft. So varying between all within the fluid imbalance spectrum, but more on the deficient side, more on the excess side, changing a little bit. And his symptoms would change a little bit. However, we always had to drain phlegm from the orifices of the mind. We always had to work that principle in his treatment because he was not ever going to get rid of that completely. He had been like that since he was a teenager and the man was as close to being in his 50s. He was very nice, he was very functional, 
but he always was going to have some level of pathology. And we could put, we could palliate it. So we had to keep that as part of a treatment plan always. Though we had to attend to the variabilities that showed up as his metabolism would move back and forth, dependent on what he ate, dependent on the seasons, dependent on other things. So you always, that's that whole idea of treatment plan, keeping on the plan, keeping moving in the right direction, though making micro adjustments, just like when you drive, right? When you drive, you always stay on the road. Sometimes you gotta make a little bit of a right and a left, but you can keep moving towards your goal and you don't wanna be in the center of the road, nor do you wanna be hitting the curb. So you're always making adjustments, but you gotta stay on the plan. And that's one of the things that you, I often see with students when they get out, that's one of the biggest challenges, staying on the plan, moving forward, keeping, the control of the treatment dynamic so that you can do your best work for the person. So essentially put in other words, the practitioners, especially those who had just come out of, of the TCM college or university have to pay attention to having this constant, this constant parameter that goes along as, as several treatments in a row, maybe five, maybe 10 treatments whether there are other variables or not, there needs to be that constant. Otherwise, in at least how Professor Jakovic sees it, it's not a treatment plan. Exactly, exactly. And certainly somebody comes in with a small acute condition, well, that plan may be a, a one-day treatment, right? You, you, you come in with a, a cold, you come in with a twisted ankle. I mean, then the, the plan is not extended. We're really talking about the chronic care that demands that long-term plan. All right, so uh, let me ask you, according to what you described earlier, the typical North American patient is a tad more challenging to handle for the TCM practitioner as compared with say the typical East Asian patient. So how would you say it may be possible to acculturate such patients to our medicine? How can a practitioner make his or her patients more positively responsive and forthcoming towards treatments overall? That's a great question. That's a great question. And the thing is, acculturation, I think, is the best way to describe that because it means we have to give them the cultural basis to understand this. And I think one of the big things is that the practitioner, when they either has to include things on their website or send things to the patient for them to understand, or talk to them when they come in, um, you know, so that the person can have some sense of what's going on. So oftentimes you want to describe to the patient, and I would, when, they, when I was full-time private practice, I would often, when a new person came in, after they filled out their intake pay, paperwork, I'd sit with them. I'd say, have you had acupuncture and East Asian medicine before? And if they said yes, I said, great, let me just talk to you about what we do here. And if they said, no, I said, great, let me just describe what we do here. I'd put them in the same category, right? And tell them, say, okay, first of all, let's make it clear. It's medicine and not magic. So medicine works on percentages. We've got to figure out what's going on. We're going to give you a sense of what we think is happening and how many times we think we need to see you before we reevaluate. So as I said that right there, we mean this works on a plan, like going to the gym or like physical therapy. We need you to go and work with this over time because most things, if they're chronic, require us to work with it and change. So just be clear about that up front. And once we do the intake, we're going to confirm that you want to go on the plan. And if you don't, then we can't really help with that. If the plan is too extended, we'll discuss that once we figure it out. Then I would say to them, okay, once we figure, once we understand that, say, let's go through these things. There's acupuncture, combustion, there's herbs, there's diet, there's physical manipulation, which is the massage or bone setting and such, and there's therapeutic breathing practices, Qigong, and explain that that's all part of a larger plan and all part of those things. And because this is so broad ranging, because we see the body as a whole, we gotta ask you questions about your stools, about your sleep, about your diet, about everything about you, right? And we really wanna relate that back to what's going on today that brought you to see us. But we need the context because you might have a bad shoulder, but your bad shoulder is attached to the rest of your body. And so if we explain it that way, then they're like, oh, now I get why they're gonna ask these other questions. Now I get it's a plan. Now I, got, I get the idea that there's multiple techniques. That's really important. And having them understand that and understand that there's a broad range of things we can work with really helps them. 
And then sometimes they go out and they read. And sometimes they read things that are really helpful and supportive. And sometimes they don't. Sometimes because the power of the internet is the power for everyone to become an, uh, you know, an author by click, 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 and it pops up there. Maybe that's good. Maybe that's not. We all know that sometimes you go out there and just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's true. So patients sometimes come in not understanding that. Or they talk to their best friend. And their best friend out there may or may not actually know anything about Chinese medicine, but may describe things and say, oh, I went to acupuncture and they did this. I went here and they did this. And that may be accurate to what this patient in front of you is going to experience, or maybe not. I've had many a person come in and say, oh, my friend said that they drew blood. And, they, and, and as we all know, bloodletting is one technique, but not necessarily a technique everyone needs. So that's also a problem that they come in with some, some tidbits of the system, thinking that's the whole system. Right? And that can also be, they expect that the needles are not gonna be manipulated, that the needles are gonna just sit and they're gonna have some, some you know, relaxing music and that's it. And it's gonna be purely spa. And as we all know, sometimes you gotta get that rotator cuff moving. Sometimes those needles gotta get into those deep muscles. That's not necessarily spa technique, right? And sometimes it's a little bit what I call memorable. You tell the patients, it'll be a little memorable. 20 seconds, you're gonna remember this one for a while. And you have to sometimes stimulate very strongly in those things or do deep tissue work with the twain or such. So when you can create that cultural base for them, it's very useful, right? And depending if you can also kind of guide them to what you know they look at and what they read. And that's why, you know, Donald, we got if we can talk about it here, but we, you know, we've been working on that project to produce a general interest text that kind of contextualizes this written for the layperson, you know, the, the practitioners, it's, it, it, you know, what we're working on right now is, is a little too general for them, but it's good for patients. It's good to like, even for people come and sit in the waiting room to look at and get a sense of, you know, what's the, the, the global view of East Asian medicine. That's really important because they didn't grow up with it. They need to take almost like a little crash course in it to understand, oh, these are the expectations. Yeah, indeed. So uh, Professor Jakovic is talking about a book project that the both of us have been working on together for the past few months. And this book is titled Chinese Medicine Can Heal You. And this is a book intended for lay people, primarily, <clears throat> sorry, primarily for the patient population. Um, it is meant not only for the sake of patients to better understand what Chinese medicine is about, but also for you practitioners, listeners, because you spend so much time explaining the medicine to patients, just this, this myriad of topics, wonderful, important things that Professor Jakovic was just talking about. You might spend as much as one or two hours over several treatment sessions or more explaining the same stuff to patients over and over again. Like, do you really want to do that continuously for 30, 40, 50 years of a career? That's a lot of talking to do, repeating yourselves. Why should you, if you're going to have this wonderful book that you can just put in the waiting room, hand out to patients, encourage them to, to get the thing. It's gonna be on Amazon later this year, later in 2021. And the book would quote unquote, quote unquote, uh, acculturate the patients into the medicine to help them get a sense of what to expect. The book tackles uh, what's going on in clinics, broadly speaking, without getting into the specifics or, of this or that style of doing East Asian medicine. It discusses the differences between East Asian medicine broadly and modern Western medicine, and specifically differences between Chinese medicine and Korean medicine, Chinese medicine, Japanese medicine, et cetera, et cetera. So it's actually, intended and useful for all practitioners of East Asian medicine broadly, but also for all of their patients and gives the patient a perspective over what are the principle, a uh, principle, sorry, this, this lovely medicine is based on and what are its roots. The fact that uh, like Professor Jakovic said, uh, traditional Chinese medicine is the longest continuous tradition of primary care medicine in the world uh, that we could trace. And overall, it would just get your patient on the right track, the right mindset, without you having to spend so much time in the clinic with every single one getting them on track. And the thing is, the, the goal of it is, of that writing project we've had, is to try to help the patients realize 
what can be treated. Because sometimes I've had patients who come in and they've got back pain and then they didn't even realize that we could have some impact on the irritable bowel or something else. And they then they're like, oh, I didn't know that. And sometimes they, you know, will realize that and they're like, oh, my cousin, my friend, my wife, my whoever could come in. You know, so the thing is, the, the, the broader they understand it, the more they can benefit. You know, as, as Jonathan, as you said, you know, it's sometimes easier for them to sit and not only... I mean, I, I know every practitioner I know doesn't mind talking to the patient and tries to help them and has a little fire, a little, a little, a little candle burning in their heart, trying to explain this to everybody they can. That's great. At the same time, sometimes the person has to hear it two or three times. They have to hear it from the practitioner, read it on a website, read it in a book or something. And then they're like, oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, that could help me with this concern. So, you know, sometimes the multiple venues by which the people encounter the information help them understand it, you know? So, you know, and then that helps them and it helps the practitioner. And then also helps the medicine grow in the West. Because as we all know, everybody who's gone into this knows there's enormous potential, enormous benefit. And there's benefit for us and space for East Asian medicine, Western medicine, and all these other formats of like Ayurveda and, and chiropractic and, and those to all exist because all of them have captured some aspect of the mystery of the body and helping the patients to understand how to navigate that. You know, that's a, that's a, that's a goal. That's a good thing. Yeah. Just think about that huge patient base that practitioners are missing on a regular basis. For instance, anybody who's got a psychological or psychiatric problem, I mean, granted, every single human being alive at one point during their, their life are going to have one type of an, or another of a psychological or psychiatric problem, even a minor one, like, a, well, there, there was a breakup, so they're depressed a little bit for a week or two, or they, they have stress. It's natural. Every human being experiences such things. The thing is that still in North America, at least, the majority of people are unaware that traditional East Asian medicine can treat such things. So you might have a patient that you've been seeing for 20 years for this or that chronic problem. And you may have been teaching her, maybe unbeknownst to her, uh, you've been helping her with her psychological issues as well. Now realize that she's got a family of, I don't know, 50 members, 100 members. And all of these people for all their lives at one point or another are going to have one or another psychological or psychiatric problem. But that patient of yours that's been with you for 20 years is not necessarily recommended those 50 to 100 family members to come to your practice simply because she's unaware that you can do those things, that you can remedy or assist psychological or psychiatric issues. And you're, you have just missed 50 or 100 patients that could have come by the personal recommendation of someone who's been with you a long time and could have brought them no problem. And that's partly why we have this book, Chinese Medicine Can Heal You, because any layperson who reads that book is going to realize that the scope of East Asian medicine is far broader than they initially thought. And then they would be far more inclined to get themselves treated or recommended to their friends, acquaintances, family members, colleagues at work, you name it. So that sort of book, by making the, the medicine, its traditions, its logic, its principles more accessible to the general public is useful for everybody, for the entire field of traditional East Asian medicine, because it pulls that hidden patient base from amongst the general population into the clinics, into everybody's clinics. I also think that our goal, part of our goal was to demystify Asian medicine. So the thing is, I think some people, you know, it's hard to say you know, how people think if they're not coming in for treatment, but oftentimes they're a little bit apprehensive and it seems kind of confusing. It's a mystery. So also laying out, oh, this is what the procedures are like. This is the way the thought process is like. This is what there is to expect and help, you know, defray some of that concern. And then, oh, maybe I'll try it. You know, certainly, you know, that's that's the thing, because even if one person, you know, goes in and gets treated and gets a benefit, you know, then 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 all of, all the development of the thousands of years is worth it, even if just one person gets a little better. So, you know, that's the thing with every practitioner, Every practitioner knows that every 
patient is the most precious one, right? Every single one, right? And that's why it hurts so bad when they don't follow the treatment plan. You're like, I'm trying here, you know? So, you know, all of this to, to, to you know, for practitioners to hopefully, you know, help their patients help, you know, help it make sense, help sometimes. Also, some people are very, very good technically, but not necessarily always so good at explaining things. So sometimes, you know, if it's written down, you know, then in, in, in a published format, then, you know, sometimes you point to the, the, the person with all those questions and say, yeah, you could check this out a little bit. And we all know there's that one patient who likes to ask you questions and put you 20 minutes behind schedule, right? <laughs> then you can say, wait a minute, here's a, here's a way to read up on that. So, you know, but hopefully we kind of put this together with the, with the plan and the hope that it's going to bring some benefit to people out there. All right. Thank you so much, Professor Jakovitz. And I very much appreciate you taking the time speaking with us all today. And once more, the name of the book that we're working on that's going to be available later in 2021 is Chinese Medicine Can Heal You. Chinese Medicine Can Heal You, and it's going to be available on any Amazon website, be it Amazon.com, Amazon.de, Amazon.co.uk, etc., etc. Once more, Professor Jakovitz, thank you for sharing with us. We'll definitely have you on and present you in additional interviews in the future. Uh, any last words or commentaries for practitioners? Well, Jonathan, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's great that we've been able to come on here and talk a bit. I think the biggest thing with practitioners, they all know every day is another day in the trenches, another day in the trenches. So, you know, out there doing the good work, you know, that's the, that's really the hallmark of this tradition that goes back thousands of years. So my, you know, hope is as the pandemic starts to ease up and everybody's out there practicing because there's going to be a lot of those long haul sequela symptoms to COVID that you're going to be able to work on. A lot of things that did not exist historically. And so we mentioned before about the classics, you, the modern practitioners, need to go and understand the principles so well because you will treat patients who have things that didn't exist historically. So my hope is that you all, you know, get out there, work hard, keep this medicine going and, you know, really venerate our tradition because of that. All right. So with all that having been said and considered, thank you all so much for listening and we'll see you around next time.